Before, I'm not doing it again. What, the hair, the hair, the <laughs> you got me at the reunion when talking about my hair. You did. All right, we're all set. Uh, Tony, you want to pray us in? Sure. Hi, Tony. Tony, not Tony. Tony. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. Go. <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. Lord, Father, we just come to you and just uh, thank you so much for this day and for the, uh, the group that's here today. And just to uh, glorify you for all you're doing. All right, so last time I prepared way too much information. This time I only prepared four slides, but we're going to recap the whole story. So let's see how uh, this goes. I learned from Gary. Uh, see if we can get into this. So um, first thing I want to do is just kind of lay out where we're at in, in how we've broken this down. So there's a covenant piece uh, that kicked off. Every, every Jew who would have been reading this um, at the time it was written would have been able to basically, uh, uh, Tim Mackey uses the word hyperlink back to the Jeremiah expectation that the covenant was being fulfilled. So every single time this story is, ha is happening, and the reason why I say it that way is because there's kind of three stories that happen over a series of time. And like there's, there's, a, there's one point where there's almost like s somewhere between 40 and 70 years between one verse. And so we read this all as like one continuous story. But in reality, like we're talking decades between some of these. So in the first six uh, uh, chapters of Ezra, uh, Zerubbabel comes in and he is, is basically trying to bring them back to uh, bring them back the temple. So he wants to he establishes the altar. They have opposition and they lay down the foundation uh, for the temple. Haggai and Zechariah, who are actually prophets, come in and say, hey, guys, I don't care what some king said. God told you to go rebuild the temple, get back on board, rebuild the temple. They lay the foundations and they celebrate. Then there's a period of time where things were going fairly well, but the work had basically stopped. And so um, Ezra comes back in and he really, his, his main focus was to reestablish the Torah because basically everything the rubble bell had done had kind of um, not necessarily fallen apart, but, but people were definitely not following uh, the way of God and they weren't um, uh, doing the sacrifices and the calendars and and following the ways of the Torah. And so um, there's, there's an altar moment and a, and a rebuilding and a re, kind of reclaiming of the temple again uh, during Ezra. But the main thing was to get the people back to the Torah. Uh, but as you guys know from what Gary said, um, 
there's this big divorce decree that kind of seemed more political than spiritual, and Ezra's heart's kind of broken from it. Haggai talks about it. Uh, some of the other prophets talk about it later. Um, it, it didn't seem like it went well. And so it's like this up and down, up and down. And so we're going to have another up and down story where we talk about the walls and Nehemiah. Um, but the thing to remember in this is there's always a rebuild moment, an opposition moment, and then kind of another rebuild moment. Um, and so we're going to walk through that um, today. Uh, I didn't know this until we started studying. There's a whole other little uh, hyperlink moment that happens in between these two books. Gary got 45 minutes to cover uh, that hyperlink. I'm going to try to do it in two. Um, so I hope you guys have been paying attention from the last couple, but we're going to hit that as well. All right, so let's run through our summary real quick. All right, so Cyrus is king. They come back. He says, you guys can go back. You can rebuild Jerusalem. I'm fine with it. He, t- he talks about all the loot that they've got. So think about this. These conquering nations come in. They steal all your treasure. They steal all your culture. They steal your top people. They move it to another city, and you're left with bare minimum if you stayed in the area. Um, so Sirius is basically saying, I'm going to give you everything back. Um, but he's also doing this as a king. So he's saying, like, you know, you're still going to be my people, but here's some of the stuff we, we, we took from you. So this big, giant group of people come. But and honestly, it's a little bit bigger than West Monroe. Um, as, as recorded, so this isn't a huge nation anymore. Um, they, we, we come in, we start to reestablish the free will offerings to rebuild the temple. All this is tying back to um, the, the reminiscent of the original temple, the tabernacle, and the Exodus story. The altar's rebuilt, and so the calendar starts to uh, be uh, followed again. The idea of, of the different festivals and the different sacrifices and the daily um, forgiveness and the daily communications with God. At the, <coughs> at the altar is starting to happen. The other thing that I love about this is that at the temple, uh, the altar was stolen, and then the altar uh, was stripped of all its pretty stuff. And so basically just a, a big pile of, not a pile, a box of rocks and wood came back. Um, and God said, I don't need all the shiny. I'm still going to show up, and I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to communicate with you, and, and we're going to have this covenant uh, calendar that we've always had so it's like even though the the shiny and the the worth that we would have or or the people of the time would have almost grieved not having God says no I'm gonna I can still use rocks and wood to glorify myself so then they start to rebuild the um uh temple there's some opposition there um and then there's this weeping of of the people who are uh we'll call them the old timers who can actually remember back when the temple and the altar were in its heyday they grieve that time and uh but but during that time there was also people rejoicing. So people who had heard these stories growing up as a kid or growing up as, as a young adult would have been excited about this. And uh, the book actually says that there, it was so loud from the, the cheering that you couldn't hear the weeping, right? But the weeping was still very loud. So there's an element there of, of, of being joyful even uh, in grief. Um, so then basically the enemies of this whole story are kind of introduced. But at first they're introduced as people who are saying, hey, What if we come help you rebuild? What if we come help you um, do this? Because if you go back to 2 Kings, they used to, uh, if they had 10 gods, the God of Jerusalem was one of them that they studied um, and that they were trying to actually help them out. That God was actually um, found favor on them once they started praising him as well. If you remember, there's a a weird story in 2 Kings where God kind of sends lions to basically get this land into... um, into order, and the lines are so bad that they like, hey, we, we got to acknowledge this God of Jerusalem. That's these same people. This would have been the descendants of some of them. So they were familiar with, uh, with the God of Jerusalem. And I love the way that Gary said it last week. There was God believers, God followers everywhere. We just see the Jewish one because that's the seed line of, of Jesus. And so people had experiences with the God who we know, and God had brought them back. And the, the, the underlying message of, of Gary's... Um, talk last week was God doesn't care about your race. He cares about who you follow, right? He wants you to follow the temple. He wants you to follow the altar. He wants to follow that lead you back to him. And so um, basically there's an argument back and forth between the opposition. They go to Artaxerxes and they say, hey, these guys are bad guys. He says, stop. And then they go back and they're like, check the records. Oh yeah, they do have permission to go do this. And so there's a a back and forth. This whole time the prophets of uh, Haggai and Zechariah are reminding them you need to be following what God says. Don't be intimidated by the opposition. You have a mission to do. You are God's people, uh, and he is your God. 
And so that gets you through about one through six. At the end of it, it's, they celebrate the Passover, again, reminding you that this is the new Exodus. And then seven starts. So again, it kind of goes back. We have this, um, the Torah is being re-implemented, and uh, you see another mini um, allusion back to, um, back to the new Exodus. So you get the Torah is implemented. Um, we get the loot. So literally, Pharaoh and the Egyptians gave... Um, the, the Israelites, um, all their silver and gold to go to their promised land, to, to Sinai. Um, and then all of a sudden there's a, a local government, and all of this is um, approved or um, commissioned by Artaxerxes to say, hey, Ezra's got basically my seal, and he can do what he needs to do. And so they go back, and they, um, they've got to recruit some more Levites because obviously some stuff has fallen off. So between chapter 6 and chapter 7, we went from having enough uh, Levites and people in the city to disobedience, and then we don't have enough people in the city. So think about how long that actually takes for that to happen. That's not an overnight thing. This was a process of, of, of falling apart and, uh, and not looking like what they had originally planned uh, to do. And so um, when he shows up, uh, he verifies uh, the temple loot is, is accounted for. He, he, lets, he basically, the, the interesting thing here with Ezra is like he's very much like a... a a Levi, he's very, I mean, uh, concerned with the Torah and like the, the teachings of the temple, but he's also having to play kind of like governor mayor of this scenario. So you see a lot back and forth where like he does something, but then he also, there's also a parallel where he's also accounting for what the king uh, had, had allowed for them to do. And so he kind of plays this spiritual and government uh, type of role. And then the last thing that happens, which, which is pretty interesting, is... Um, this this weird uh, divorce um, thing. So basically, there was a lot of mixed married um, uh, groups, and the reason was because the, like the remnant was still there. So these people never left this land, but then there was a lot of people who came back. Both people lived with strangers and people who were not Jews, right? And so in this, there's no reason for them. There's no logical reason for them to have stayed marrying Jews, one, out of just sheer numbers, and then two, like that's not the culture that was promoted in the land or in, in Babylon. So there's this mixed um, life uh, that's happening. And so the, they, they have this committee, and they, they basically say everybody's got to get divorced uh, who's, who's married to a non-Jew. Um, and it, it just doesn't go well. It doesn't look good. It creates more enemies. The people aren't happy. Um, and it's... It's really just kind of an ugly, weird way to end the story that looked like it was headed toward a really interesting uh, place for restoration for God's people. Ooh. So, um, the, oh, the, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So at the end of the day, though, there's a giant list of all the people who were intermarried and, and, and where their descendants went. And it sounds like a little ostracizing, but it was also, Gary calls out that there was a chance that there was a... Um, a group of people who was actually taking care of, making sure those people were taken care of, and then this was a documentation of that, uh, so that they, you know, we didn't just lose random people in in this um, experience. And so they would would have been like, hey, this is where they're going to go. This is where they're how they're going to get taken care of. That's Gary kind of reading between the lines, but um, it seems to make sense with with the way that um, uh, procedures and 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 uh, the, the, that type of council would have been um, developed for. So that gets us up to Ezra. So basically, we've had this amazing moment where we bring the altar back. Temple stuff starts to happen. We have this amazing moment where people start to um, <clears throat> uh, obey the Torah. And then we, with the temple, with the temple we, we get scared and we fall away. And then with the Torah, we get off on the wrong foot with this whole divorce thing. And then all of a sudden, that starts to deteriorate. So hop into Nehemiah. So that's going to be Nehemiah 1 now. <coughs> Uh, I brought this up before, and I think this is really cool. This is a symmetrical story again, and he's done this in all three sections. Uh, he's going to start with Hanani. He's going to end with Hanani. He's going to start with a letter. He's going to end with a letter. You're going to have opposition. There's going to be opposition. You're going to see um, some rebuilding organized. You're going to see some rebuilding organized. And so, like, this is a really cool literary thing that the Jewish authors do, um, and it lends significance and credibility, which is exactly what was happening to those people those people were coming back to establish themselves as a kingdom. So they needed credibility. They needed to be able to be established. And so this mirrors, this story actually mirrors their process of establishing themselves as a nation and as God's people, and more importantly, the covenant. 
And so this literary device to me is really important because it does mirror that, um, that simile. So to remind you what we're about to talk about, we're going to talk about the rebuilding, the walls of Jerusalem, the opposition and the rebuild uh, under Nehemiah. And if you don't know anything about Nehemiah, he's a great guy, so we'll talk about him for a little bit too. Yeah, but yep. it would so the, the decree would have been for the Israelites to divorce the foreigners. Okay. Yeah. So it was a, the idea of a pure race, the idea of a, a mixed uh, marriage that would have been the, the context there. So and, and Gary called out that it went from God's chosen people to God's chosen race in just a few sentences, and that's not what it was ever. Um, and the more you read this and the more you read Kings, we've missed in the Old Testament big time that, that, the, that God's love and covenant wasn't for everybody. Like God was evangelistic in the Old Testament when we talked about Jonah as an obvious reference. So like these people that came back to, to worship him, like God still punished that land and then gave them a chance to enter into uh, a relationship with him. And so uh, I think a lot of times, at least I, I know I, growing up, it was like, that it was just for Israel, it was just for Israel. It really, the more you look into the Old Testament, God was still seek, seeking out everyone. Um, but they still had to come through his way, which would have been um, doing, uh, following the Torah. And if you actually look at what the Torah you know, preaches and teaches, you know, it was a way to protect his people, to give them a covenant, and to give them an open communication with him. It's really not that different than the New Testament. It's just God's done it in a, in a much more... Um, impressive and blatant way since we couldn't pick up on it the first time. Um, that's my opinion. You don't have to take that one. Um, all right, so here's what happens. So this was the new Exodus. This was kind of the new Moses with Ezra. And now we're going to get kind of the new Joshua story. So if you remember Joshua, um, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah kind of takes this over from Ezra. Uh, Joshua took this over from Moses. You're going to see a ton of Deuteronomy uh, quotes. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but basically, this is, uh, it's almost like a passing of the torch um, for us to uh, be able to see what uh, Nehemiah is doing. So if you think or know anything about the Joshua story as you read some of this or hear this, think about that. <clears throat> um, it's, it's really interesting. And what that, all that does is lends credibility to what Nehemiah is doing. Does that make sense? Because that's, that's the majority of the story is lending credibility to what was happening to the Jewish people at this time. Okay. So... We're not going to read it. You feel, if you can read faster than I can uh, recap, go ahead. Um, but it takes about 16 minutes to read, so I uh, chose to, to go the Gary uh, table, <coughs> table route. So, again, we got a king. He's going to come in here. Oop. Catch up with you guys on here. So we've got a, a, a king, um, that uh, new king, Artaxerxes. And so uh, Hanani is, this, is Nehemiah's brother, um, and they meet up, and he says, hey, man, how's our people doing? How's the remnant doing? Because Nehemiah is in the, in the king's uh, court, and he says, man, it's not good. He goes, you know, they're, they're frustrated. They're, they're not following the tour. The walls are, are in shambles. Some of them are on fire. Man, it really isn't a good scene there, Nehemiah. I don't know what you've been told. And this breaks Nehemiah's heart, so he talks to Artaxerxes about it as the, the cupbearer. Artaxerxes sends him back um, and says, hey, man, uh, I appreciate everything you've done for me. Go be the governor of Jerusalem. And then chapter 2, uh, we got these enemies coming back again, uh, uh, Sen Sanballat and uh, Tobiah. Uh, and they start spreading rumors, and they start talking, and they're basically, um, they're, they're not a big fan of the Jews being in that area. Um, but what's really cool about this, and this, I think this, if, if I do preach, this is going to be part of the 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 um, a big part of it. Nehemiah goes back in the dark of night to examine everything that happened. He doesn't tell everybody he's going to do it. He doesn't make this giant parade. He doesn't do a big announcement. He doesn't try to like rally the troops. Like he just goes in the night quietly and inspects all the walls, and and uh, and and basically figures out what you know Jerusalem's reproach is. And so he gathers all the information. He gathers all the research. And he figures out what he needs to go do. Um, and so there start to be a buzz that, that the, the Jews are coming back again to rebuild, um, that there's more of them coming. Um, and so Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and now this guy Geshem and his people, 
they they call out that the Jews are rebellious, and so um, they're starting to see that you know potential fights could come, that there's um, opposition, and so the people get genuinely uh, nervous, and so you kind of hear this, hey, we're rebuilding, then opposition, rebuilding, then opposition. So Nehemiah organizes these teams because um, it. it you think about it, they had rebuilt the walls uh, a decent amount, um, but they're already in shambles. And so he basically puts everybody where the, where the uh, walls are breaking down. And then at this point, these guys, uh, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, are just getting rude and, like, honestly tacky. And they're just, like, mocking them. They're opposing them. They're sending people by to, to holler at them. Um, and and it's, just, it's just clear that it's, they don't want them around. And... Um, so then there's this prayer of vindication um, that, that Nehemiah has. And I just love, and I want to make this point because I'll make it probably a couple more times, is that in the face of opposition and mocking and, and being called rebellious and, and lies being said about you, uh, Nehemiah's response was a prayer for vindication. He said, my God's going to fight for me, not me. And so one of my favorite things to always go back to is when you're facing adversity, you look at Jesus and, and his most adverse time when he was being um, tried, he said nothing because he didn't have to defend himself because God does, takes care of that. And so as men, as, as people, as women, you guys, uh, y'all are prideful too, um, we, ha- we feel like we always have to defend ourselves. And more times than not, we need to just let God fight for us. And so a prayer for vindication, a prayer for God to handle uh, what he's already been handling is, is a great point. And so we hit this halfway point where the walls are joined together. And this is a special Hebrew word, and it's used um, in this story twice. And that's an indicator uh, by the author that, that something interesting uh, is, is paralleled. So we've got a, a positive joining together at half the height. The walls are, are looking good. And I want to stop for a commercial break. This is the new Joshua story. This is the new Exodus story. When, when have we also heard, um, you know, the walls of God, the Jericho walls, right? So if you go to chapter 5 of Joshua, it starts off, it says, uh, this is the same phrase that's used for the opposition in, uh, in Nehemiah. As soon as all the kings and Amorites who were beyond the Jordan went to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they crossed over. Their hearts melted, and they were no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. And so then in chapter 9 it says, As soon as the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and the lowland all along the coast of the great sea of Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together one to fight against Joshua and Israel. And so um, this is the same language that was used um, when when Joshua kept encountering uh, his opposition. Um, The idea of uh, something being heard and then opposition happening is mentioned seven times in um, in Nehemiah, which would have been a a marker for any Jew at the time to be like, hey, let's pay attention to that. Um, But this is calling out that like, Watch how Nehemiah handles the opposition. One, he's like Joshua, but two, actually watch the example that Nehemiah does whenever uh, this stuff starts to happen. And he does it really well at first, and then he kind of blows it at the end. Um, but he's human just like the rest of us. Um, but, but this is a regular occurrence, and it's a regular pattern for, for the Jewish people. All right, so then we go in. And there's another joining, exact same word, but this is the, an opposition joining. So uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and others, they join together in opposition. And so then opposition happens. What does Nehemiah do? Prays for protection. And so the enemies come, and they mock, and, and they see that there's, uh, there's um, things happening. They, they come back, and they're, uh, they're, they're not just mocking at this point. They're also talking about schemes to, to attack. And so just like uh, Joshua, when God starts moving, opposition starts to hear about it, and they, uh, and they, they start to um, creep in to, to intimidate. And so um, Nehemiah 4 is one of my favorite um, chapters in, in here and because it's, it's got a phenomenal verse uh, that, that I'll be preaching on whenever we do our preaching time. Um, but the main thing you need to realize here is that Nehemiah said, look, I don't want to, 
I want you as people are scared that you're about to be attacked. So we've got these rebuilding teams, but they're also going to be armed, and they're also going to be about prep, prepped for war. And so Nehemiah heard their fears. He, he recognized the reality and said, we still got a job to do, but let me also acknowledge the fear and the position you were in as a person or as a, as a people. And so he armed these rebuilding teams with a sword and a hammer. And so you've, you've probably heard that analogy. If you've heard anything on Nehemiah, have your sword and your hammer ready. Um, and that's a common uh, theme. So um, chapter five is a really interesting uh, thing. It's, it's talking about kind of him as a governor. Basically, they come and complain and they find out that like these Israelites are having to sell their kids, their families into slavery because they can't pay the Persian taxes. And Nehemiah is like, whoa, I, I'm not, I did this on the cheap. I didn't, I didn't use, I didn't, I'm not taking any of that money. Like, how do we establish that? And so he's trying to figure out what's going on. But like, it kind of is a, is a little bit of a commercial in the story to remind you that like the people don't have it well. Like, this is not what they thought it was going to be. I mean, if you're, you're selling your kids into slavery, uh, you're not having a good day, right? But more importantly, what they found out was that Nehemiah uh, found out that the Israelites were loaning, loaning money to each other with interest. And if you go back to the days of the Torah and the back of the days of Egypt, that was prohibited in the law of, um, in the law of Moses. You weren't allowed to lend to a brother uh, and charge interest. And so basically, you're not allowed to take advantage of your brothers. So as a people, they were getting taken advantage of by the Persian tax, so they felt oppressed. But then on top of that, inside their own community, they felt oppressed because they were, they were having to sell their kids into slavery because they couldn't afford the taxes uh, and the interest on some of these loans. So it's a nice little mirror there to let you know, like, these people still don't feel like this is the promised land, right? This doesn't, this doesn't feel like the Jeremiah covenant. This doesn't feel like a, a restoration. Um, and so... Um, the the bad, the bad guys, the enemies, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, um, they actually let out a plan that they're going to come attack at night. And so, um, and so Nehemiah has to figure out uh, a plan for that. Um, again, that mirrors kind of his ride at night to, to figure out um, what they need to do to protect themselves. And then um, the opposition, again, makes uh, a claim and a, and a plea to try to get... Um, uh, Nehemiah out of there uh, but at the end of it it ends with um, Hananiah and the city and everything starts to kind of repopulate so seems like the walls are built seems like more people are coming in this should, this should all be like a really good story right like we should all be excited that, that this is happening um, and so it kind of sets up like this happy moment that's going to happen in chapter 8 I mean uh, yeah 8 through 12 where it seems like everything's going awesome we finally got it right we're finally moving in in the right direction. And that's not how it works out. So um, that's the story from beginning to end and to, or to right here. And so one of the things that I, I want us to, to look at is, um, let's go to, ch turn to chapter 4, verse 9. Yep. All right. Somebody can read loud. But we pray to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So um, he goes back and he says that he's got. Um, So at, at this point, he's, he's got the, um, he's worried about the, these people coming in. And so they come in and they pray. And then, maybe I made you read the wrong thing. Praise for protection for nine. Oh, let me go back to this. Yeah. Okay. So when, when these people start to... Um, All right, so if you go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, um, this, it starts off here. And so Joshua's dealing with all this. It says, 
And when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart, with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. All right. <clears throat> so these guys have been scattered all over, the, right? They've been um, basically ripped from their land multiple times. They've tried to come back and rebuild it, and it's not working out. And he says, if you're outcast are in the uttermost parts of heaven. From there, the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And so if you look at what um, Nehemiah is trying to do here, there's a, there's a term um, in Nehemiah 4 where he says... Um, right here you'll see this phrase so this in 14 he says and i looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people do not be afraid of them remember the lord, your lord is great who is great and awesome and fights for your brothers sons your daughters your wives and your homes and so multiple times here you'll see that nehemiah throughout chapter four um it says that he talked to the officials and to the nobles and to the rest of the people. And so this idea of who, who's in the society is important. But more importantly, you notice he says, do not, do not be afraid. Then he says, remember your Lord. Remember that he's great. And then he's going to fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters. And so at that point in chapter, in chapter 4, he's basically going around to each one of these um, uh, wall areas, and he, he's reminding them that, hey, I know the enemy may be coming, I know the enemy may be pressing down on you, but here's an opportunity for you to, here's an opportunity for us to let God, God fight for us. And so it says um, in verse 16, so from that day on, half of the servants worked constructions and half held spears, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stood behind the house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders had swords strapped at his side while they built. The man sounded the trumpet was beside me. And so that trumpet call is actually also a call back to Joshua, right? So the idea of the trumpet call um, and the idea of taking the wall um, because the in an actual battle, right, the trumpets would go before and basically acknowledge that war was happening. And so if this analogy here is really interesting because basically Nehemiah is saying, basically wherever I'm going, I'm fighting for who? Right? I'm bringing the fight, and then God's going to fight for us here. So he says, the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Verse 19, he says, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, this is my favorite, I love this, I'm going to start crying. The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us, our God will fight for us. So, think about this. They've got all these different places that they're trying to build up. They've literally are rebuilding walls that they're, they've either already rebuilt or their, their families have already rebuilt before. They've got enemies surround them. And Nehemiah is just going from position to position, telling them, hey, keep it up. You got this. Keep going. Hey, if it gets bad, don't worry. We got a plan. You got your sword. You got your hammer. We're going to do this. But don't worry about it. I know you feel tired. I know you feel scared. If you hear the trumpet, rally, because we're all going to fight. We're all going to be there for each other. But God will fight for us. So the whole time here, like Israel has been trying to do it themselves. And in this moment, he's like, no matter no matter what you're up against, God will fight for us. I've got the trumpet right next to me. And as soon as we see the fight coming, we're going to call. And if you answer that call, you're going to show up right next to your brothers and sisters. And God will fight for us. You see, before, they kept trying to do it. And before, they kept trying to do it. And in a minute, they're going to try to do it themselves, right? Like, but 
Nehemiah understands that, that it's important, one, that everybody knows. So there's a societal thing, right? Because Nehemiah is basically coming in as governor, but he's also coming in as Joshua. So Joshua had to go fight for his people, but Joshua also had to carry out everything that Moses had laid out, right? How did, uh, how did Joshua um, get his credibility? He walked along the dry ground, and all of a sudden the enemies show up. So as soon as Joshua starts acting like Moses, people show up. As soon as Joshua, uh, so and the other piece of that is, when did, um, when did Joshua make his name for himself? Remember when he first comes onto the scene? As a spy. When do spies go places? In the middle of the night. When did Nehemiah go to his walls? In the middle of the night. What did Joshua say when Joshua came back? And who is he going to give it to him? The Lord our God is going to give it to him. So then they go like crazy people, and then what, what, what do they walk around doing? What's, the, what's, what's out there making all the noise going around the Jericho walls? A bunch of trumpets. So they've got these giant walls that ancient times had probably never seen before. So they've got tons of trumpets going around this, and they've got a whole army behind them. But in the remnant, which is actually a complimentary term, they have rocks. They have half-built walls. The enemies are coming to them. And Nehemiah is going with him saying, I've been sent here by God. I came in the middle of the night. I assessed the situation, and I realized that it was not a big deal. Like, this is well within God's reach to be able to restore this. And so he's now going to each one of those walls with the trumpet and reminding them that if the fight comes, we've got a trumpet and we've got a God. So... This whole story, everything that we do, everything that they're doing, keeps going back to this restoration story that started back in Exodus that said, I am your God, you're my people, and I am your God. And so he doesn't negate the fact that they still had to rebuild the walls. It doesn't negate the fact for obedience. It doesn't negate the fact for um, their abilities to be able to stay committed and, and do that. But just like with the temple, he's like, I'm bringing back a, you know, C minus altar for you to sacrifice on, but all of a sudden it works. Why? Because I am God. And I don't need rocks and wood to establish myself. I just need a relationship with you. Comes back with Ezra and the Torah, and they're actually participating in these in, in reading the uh, the Torah and singing these praises out loud. And it's makeshift at best compared to what the old temple to be. But what does God say? I'm showing up because this is my house and these are my people. And now with these walls, he's doing it again. But Ezra's kind of having to play this like Paul Revere, like um, Braveheart character. And he's like going around trying to tell him like, hey, you got this, you got this, you got this. And these, these things, these, these um, reminders would have been a, a great uh, call back to who Joshua was and to the stories that they would have heard before to encourage the people to stay true. I saw a couple of hands up. Yeah, just all this, you know, the culmination of it reminds me of what, you know, the prophet, Joel's prophecy and then what the Apostle Paul here brings is on the stand that if anyone calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, it's just to me about salvation. Well, and all of that's a call back to, to Jeremiah, right? Like all, of, and, and Isaiah. Um, one of the things that I, I, I meant to, no, I'm not, that's next. Did you raise your hand?
Right. You know, um, that, we're all, that God is still fighting for us on the home front as much as he is in front of him and in front of the city and in front of our community. Yeah. No, absolutely. So one of the things that's interesting to me is the fact that all that started with Ezra, uh, with Nehemiah being the cupbearer. And so Nehemiah didn't go back. Um, so Nehemiah doesn't go back uh, with Ezra and, um, and Zerubbabel. Um, he's the cupbearer to the king. And so one of the things, somebody go to Isaiah 41 through 3 while I set this up. So every, the, the most quoted um, scriptures from the Old Testament are Isaiah and Jeremiah um, in, in the New Testament. And so uh, whenever the Jewish people would have heard, like, the word of God or the, the, the Old Testament or the, um, those scriptures, that's what even, like, a New Testament Jew would have thought back then. So Nehemiah um, discerns this call. Like, he responds to his brothers. His, his heart is grieved and heavy. And so he says, you know what? Like, i got to figure out how to do something. But it doesn't really say that he's figured it out. And so all of a sudden the king says, hey, man, it looks like you're having a bad day. That's not normal. Are you sick? So this guy has, so Nehemiah's been a cupbearer in his courts forever. The guy has a personal enough relationship, the king has a personal enough relationship with Nehemiah to be like, hey man, you don't seem like you're doing good. And God takes that conversation and sends Nehemiah back to do his will. Like God moves with this insignificant cupbearer. So in Isaiah 40, 1 through 3, who's got it? Ready? Go. 1 through 3? Yeah, 1 through 3. Keep silent before me, O coast. That is not what I had there, man. That was 41, not 40. Okay. 41. Oh, 41. Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 40, <laughs> 1, 30. Comma, that's right. Okay. I was like, Here we go. I missed that. The word of the Lord. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. There we says go. Says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem, and cry out to her. Comfort her, because her wicked ones have fallen. Her sins have There you go. That's right. So Nehemiah's name literally means God's comfort or bringing God's comfort. And so his name alone is a callback to saying, hey, you know that voice in the wilderness, that voice in Babylon that you guys have been crying out? This is my guy. Last time they were in captivity, <clears throat> God prepared the way with another cupbearer. Does anybody remember the cupbearer story with, with Pharaoh? So Joseph's in prison. Cupbearer comes to him, has a dream. Next thing we know, Joseph's the guy who tells dreams. Joseph is there, rules, takes care of his people, and, uh, and people come back. So um, that's supposed to say Psalms 1, uh, 1, 1, 6, uh, sorry, 116. Um, but it's basically the, the, it says, What shall I render to God for all that he has done? And it says, I raise up my cup of salvation. And that one's been a big thing for me because at the end of the day, God is the one who fills up our cup. So as cupbearers, <clears throat> and Jesus says what? This is my cup. And so in this moment, God literally starts to take all these little pieces and reminds us um, as, as we take Passover, as we take communion, that like this cup of salvation is mine, and I'm just going to keep filling it up. So the cupbearer literally, think about it. If you say, I'm going to be the cupbearer for the king, what are you doing? You say, I'm willing to die so that the king can continue to do what he's doing. So, right, the cupbearer comes in, takes a sip, takes a bite. If he doesn't die, they give it to the king. Like, hey, the king's thirsty. We go get him something to drink. Like, it's his job to make sure the king is on point and ready to do his work and his mission. That's what we have to, we have to look like. So, in this, God's providence shows up. Um, Deuteronomy 30 is um, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel are kind of all the, the callbacks in this story. So, if you go back and you look at those, there's two themes. 
One, uh, in Deuteronomy, it's like if my people are disobedient, they're going to get scattered, but I'll always bring them back if they start to, look, um, start to follow me again. And so these guys were spread to the, um, all over the, the land. They get brought back to Jerusalem. Jeremiah says, hey, these are, uh, you're my people, and this is the new covenant, calls them back. And then Ezekiel is trying to remind them again, like, hey, it's not about what you do. I need you to have a new heart, and I need you to be able to realize that this is a new covenant. And um, it's really interesting to me that Joshua, I love, I love the parallel, that Joshua was a spy and went in the middle of the night to assess the land and already claimed victory for God. Nehemiah takes his midnight ride and goes, says, you know what? This is what we got to do. Here's what we're going to go do. Let me unify the people. And so he rises above the opposition and he prays for protection and vindication and he gives all of that to God. But through all of that, he's listening and he's sensitive to the people who were tax poor and in justice. So we don't get a pass when our life is hard. We still have to look like the creator and the king. We have to take care of those who are around us. So they actually finish the walls up to a certain height. And it looks like things are going to go well. Like it looks like, you know, they're really excited uh, uh, about it. And we'll find out later that, you know, things go good for a little while. And then for some reason, it just kind of dies. But in this moment, what, takes, what it takes to build a city and a civilization is um, a foundation, which was the temple, a culture, which is the Torah, and walls to establish where your land are. That nation did not exist. God pulled it up from the remnant, remnant and left it. And this is the beginning of the Israelite nation that Jesus comes back to in the New Testament. So out of rubble, he turns up walls, and he starts to build out his, his, his kingdom, and he's bringing the quarter, cornerstone uh, later in the New Testament. And so he's setting this up for himself. That's it. You guys have a good one. I should say any questions. I don't know. I, I feel like I wrapped that up like a poem. Anybody got anything? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.